Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Wayne Larson. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director for the City of Mesquite. And on behalf of uh, city staff and council, we're very excited that you're here this evening to learn more about our fire department. Uh, this is Town Hall Tuesday. As probably most or all of you know, this is just another way that we're trying to get information out to our citizens, but also not only get information out to our citizens, but get input from our citizens. Uh, in this type of format. So with that being said, we're going to have a series of presentations by our fire department and then afterwards we'd love to take questions and get some dialogue going with, with those of you that are here about our fire department and any questions you might have about our fire department or fire services. Uh, as a reminder, uh, some of you who may know this, uh, we uh, are involved in social media and as, as a part of being involved in social media, we are broadcasting this, this uh, uh, meeting and this, this event live on Facebook. So uh, you'll be a part of that. And then any of you, your friends or neighbors you want to share this with, they can watch it uh, on our Facebook page afterwards. Uh, and there will be comments listed, of course, there in questions. So um, a couple of items. Uh, on your chair, you should have seen a double-sided flyer. Please take this home with you. Take a couple extra if you want to share with your friends and neighbors. Uh, this has become quite popular at this event and some other events. Uh, it's a stay informed, stay connected flyer. On one side, you'll find all the ways that you can stay engaged and, and, and educated about what's going on in the city and the different programs and different ways that you can stay informed. And on the back is just a whole list of really helpful phone numbers from the various departments and the services and programs that we offer at the, at the City of Mesquite. So please take this home, put it on the fridge, share it with your, your friends and, and, and neighbors. And then tonight, for those of you that are here, uh, the fire department has a complimentary emergency kit for you to take home. It's got a lot of cool stuff in here uh, uh, to, to help you and your, your family in case there's an emergency, some things to, to help you in that, that situation. So they're on the back tables. Uh, please take one home with you as, as a thank you from us for taking time out of your busy schedule to come join us on this, on this Town Hall Tuesday. So with, uh, with that being said, again, thank you for being here on behalf of the, the City of, of Mesquite. We're really excited to offer these Town Hall Tuesdays throughout the year to, to help educate our, our, our citizens. So uh, we're going to start our program with our, our Fire Chief, uh, uh, Mark Kirby, who will begin the program and then transition to, to other members of his command staff to present to you various items of the Mesquite Fire Department. So, Chief Kirby. Thank you, Wayne. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight on Tuesday night. I know some of you have had dinner, some of you had not had dinner. Um, but we want to thank you for being here for just a brief uh, introduction into what your fire department does. Um, we, we get out and do a lot of community events. Right now we're doing our Citizens Fire Academy, and I want to put a plug in for that if any of you would like to attend that. We do it every, uh, I think we start in September. It goes through the first part of November each year, and as soon as this one's over in a few weeks, we'll be taking applications for next year. So it's something to think about, and uh, we'll, we'll put you through all these paces that you see up here in our loop as far as our physical agility. You can do as much or as little as you, you would like, but we, we show you a little bit of everything the fire department does. Uh, my name is Mark Kirby, and uh, I have been the uh, fire chief here for 14 years. It's been my pleasure to be the fire chief for 14 years. Um, I have been with the department for 32 years. I hired on uh, in 1985 with a good group of guys. One of them sitting right over here is our councilman now, Councilman Tandy Burroughs. Uh, we hired on in 1985. I think you were at 84, though, a month before I was. And things have changed a lot in our fire department. Uh, everything's changed a lot, I guess, since the 80s, but uh, the fire service has definitely changed. Some of the core services that we provide are still there, though, for the citizens. They're still our bread and butter and what we, what we do every day or what our men and women do every day out, out in the field. And I'm going to go over a little bit of that, and then we're going to go through a little sections of them. And if you just kind of hold your question, unless you just have a burn, you just got to know something, and we'll get to the questions at the end. So we'll get started here. Just a little bit about those services. Uh, we provide, of course, fire and rescue service. And we kind of separate those out a little bit, fire being... Typically what you think of fires, either structure fires, car fires, dumpster fires, grass fires, any of those type of fires. Rescue being, we do a lot of rescue stuff out on the highway and people are trapped in cars because of the result of motor vehicle accidents. Emergency medical services, uh, that's what we do the most of and that's where we are little white ambulances that go around all over town and uh, we help people that are either sick, injured, um, and take them to the hospital if they need to go to the hospital. We've been doing that since the early 60s. 
fire prevention, the best fire, keep, the best way to fight a fire is to keep it from ever happening. Uh, fire is very destructive, and what we do to combat a fire is very destructive. So the best thing we could do is, is to prevent that fire in the first place. And then uh, public education, uh, we do that in various ways for various different things, one of which is the little canister for emergency management on being prepared. Other is, again, our fire prevention activities. And, of course, emergency management, which is something kind of gets left out of what we do, but you kind of saw it with Hurricane Harvey and some of the things that, some of the hurricanes. That is a, just a big task to take on at such a grand scale, and that is our emergency management uh, profession that does that kind of work. They're the logistics behind a, a lot of what you see. If you think of logistics like distribution, so they handle all some of the heavy moving, get the assets where we need it so we can help people. A little bit about our department. We've got 200 people that are authorized sworn personnel. That includes myself. We have six civilian personnel in our department. And uh, our operations personnel, they work on what we call a 2448. Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing, sir? Um, and that's a, they come to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they get off 7 o'clock the next morning. They're there the whole 24 hours. Not a lot of people are familiar with that schedule. Uh, the fire department's about one of the only professions that does that, but uh, it, it makes for a, a little bit long day, but you get a couple days off before you come back. So the fire station, you're there about a third of your life, and you have more of a family relationship with the people that you work with. Uh, st our staff personnel work a regular 40-hour week, and that includes myself, and we have seven fire stations. And where are those fire stations? Well, they're right here. You can see them. They're, they're basically where, up, where most of our people live. That's where we have them situated. They're strategically located. Uh, station 1 is just down the street here. Uh, it's in the central part of Mesquite, and Station 5 is just up the street the other way. And those are our, some of our two busiest fire stations. And of course, they, they kind of built out as a city built out over the years. And Station 7 is our further south fire station, and it also covers that yellow area out there in Kaufman County as well. And it, we will continue going south and build out those fire stations as, as the population increases. Some of our equipment. You probably saw some of this when you walked in. We have our fire engine. And we call it an engine, and basically it does all the, the pumping of water. It's what you normally would, would take to a structured fire to pull the hoses out and actually put the fire out. And we have seven of those. And we call these trucks. It's actually called a, it's actually called a quint because it has so many different capabilities. But it's also out there. It's the ladder truck that was extended out. It's a, that's a 105-foot ladder. We have two of those. We have one that's a 70-plus-foot 70, 70 a platform that actually has a platform people get can get in at, and it's on the north end of town. Our ambulances, uh, we have seven of those right now, and that's ambulance five, and that's the ac actual one that was out there that y'all y'all got to see walking in. Specialty vehicles that we have, one of which is our light and air truck, it has rescue tools on it, but it also has a big light tower, a generator on it, as well as an air supply. Uh, you see some of these uh, pieces of equipment over here. One of them is our SCBA tank, and that holds compressed air. It doesn't hold pure oxygen. It's compressed air, just the normal 21% oxygen that you breathe, breathe when you're outside. But it's compressed so we can take it in with us because you can't breathe inside a house that's on fire. And uh, that actually will allow us to air those tanks up while we're on scene if we have a big fire. Another specialty vehicle, we have two of these, and actually they're four-wheel drive grass trucks. They carry water on them, a smaller, smaller pump, and they're built more for efficiency of water, and they're, they're used to go out and fight. Um, I won't say wildfires, because you think of wildfires, you think of forest fires. They're not built for that. They're more for brush fires. So we could go out in the middle of a field and put out a brush or a couple trees and stuff like that that we get out in that area that we talked about in Coffin County. We'll talk a little bit about response times. And these are the time it takes when we get the actual dispatch of an emergency in Mesquite to the time we get to the emergency. And these are average times. And for a fire call, we average about 5 minutes and 35 seconds, which is pretty good. On an EMS call, we're a little quicker. Those ambulances are just a little quicker than the fire trucks are. And it's right at 5 minutes. And they're real close to our goals. I think our goal for EMS calls is 4 minutes and 59 seconds, what we determined. So we're really close to our average goal that we have for the department. So how many calls do we get in the city of Mesquite? Well, 2016, we got 18,549 calls. So we're right at about 19,000 calls a year. Four, 466 were fire response calls, and that sounds like a lot, but those aren't all structure fires. Only 196 of them are structure fires. 
that statistic stays pretty steady every year, it seems like. We have right around 200. Someone asked me, how many, how many house fires do you have in a year in Mesquite? Right around 200. And I'm pretty close every year. It just, that's where it's at. That's where it stays. The rest of the calls, as you can see, 13,868 of them, the majority, are EMS calls. Medical calls. That's what the majority of our runs are, are medical calls. A few false alarms and about 3,000 other responses, mutual aid calls, hazmat calls, and just public service calls. People need us for something a little different. Talk a little bit about when we're the busiest. When would you think we were the busiest? At night? Not really. We're the busiest when y'all are the busiest, when people are the busiest. When you're the most active, that's when we're the busiest. That's when all the motor vehicle accidents happen. That's when people call us for, for, for different things. But we're the most busiest during, during the daytime hours. This little chart right here just kind of shows it from 12 midnight on until about 11 p.m. at night. And you can see the big spike there around 7 a.m., 5 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m. And it kind of flattens out when people are at work. Peaks up a little bit at 5 p.m. when they're coming home from work. And they get settled in, have dinner, start going to bed, watching a little TV, starts going down. Just the way it is. You can look at almost any fire department, the charts go look the same. Now we're going to talk about a little bit specifically about different divisions in our department. I'm going to hand it off to Captain Brian Staples. He's our EMS coordinator. Brian, you want to come up here and take it away? Thank you all for coming tonight. Like Chief said, my name is Brian Staples. I'm the EMS coordinator, which is a really fancy way to say I manage the daily stuff for EMS. So everything from making sure we are a licensed EMS provider with the state of Texas, down to making sure that we have enough of the most cost-efficient Band-Aid we can find, everything in between. So I do a lot with the Texas Department of State Health Services and the DEA and our medical control doctors down at Parkland and EMS supply providers and vendors. So I talk to a lot of interesting people every day with all of that stuff. So EMS in Mesquite started at 1958. That's when we got our first ambulance. We didn't really call it an ambulance then because we didn't really have much training and much equipment. It was really just you call, we haul. We'd show up, somebody needs help, and we'd throw them in the back of the truck and we'd get them to the hospital. And that's really all we had the capabilities of doing. Uh, luckily, things progressed pretty quickly after that. We got a few more ambulances. And in 1983, we got our first paramedic. And I mean our first one. There was one per shift, and that guy had to ride the ambulance every day. And that ambulance had to go to every bad call in the city because he was the paramedic. So we had some other ambulances that we considered basic life support, BLS, and we had the one advanced life support ambulance at that time. And so that guy had a lot of very busy days and weeks and years, even as the number of paramedics grew with the city. So now we're doing really good. We have seven ambulances and all of our staff with two paramedics all the time. So we're advanced life support for every single ambulance that comes across. We don't really even call them ambulances at this point. We call them mobile intensive care units, MICUs, because the level of care that you will receive in the ambulance for most incidents is really similar to what you'll receive in the emergency room. On top of that, the seven engines that Chief mentions, they're also advanced life support engines. They all have at least one paramedic. It's usually two or three, but there's always at least one paramedic, and they have the same equipment that the ambulance has. Same thing with our two ladder trucks. Advanced life support, they always have at least one paramedic. They have the same tools as the ambulance. They can do everything that the ambulance can do except take you to the hospital. Uh, it'd be nice if we could just throw you on the hose bed, but <laughs> the text dot really has some issues with us transporting that way. So got to have the ambulance to take you somewhere, but the trucks and engines can do all the same things that the ambulance can do. And we run all types of calls from the most horrific, gruesome thing that you can imagine, just people being torn up to childbirth, down to I personally have been on a call in the middle of the night for a mosquito bite. So if you can dream it, we've been there. <laughs> we do that. So the chief said we did 13,800 EMS calls last year, and we transported 7,800 people. So we stay pretty busy with all of that. We did 20, two, just a little over 2,000 motor vehicle accidents last year, and that's something that is really growing on us. It's, it's growing at a speed that amazes us. 
So be careful out there. You know, you can bump into somebody at anywhere in the city, but the highways are where it's really dangerous. Most of our wrecks are on 635, as I'm sure you all could imagine. But we hit all the highways pretty regular. So as I was saying earlier, the, if you want to keep all the paint on your car, best to stay off 635 is really, is really the best move there. But one type of call that I really wanted to talk to you tonight about was cardiac arrest. And there's no real friendly way to say this. Uh, that's somebody whose heart has stopped beating. So they're dead when we get there. So that is something we have really worked hard to get better at is bringing these people back to life. And for us, we counted as a save if we showed up with somebody with no heartbeat. We treated them, they went to the hospital, and they went back home. That's how we calculate a save. Every city does it different, so it's really tough for an apples to apples comparison against us in Garland or Dallas or even like Los Angeles. There's really, it's hard to compare that. So what we've compared to is ourself. And over the last decade, we've been able to more than double our save rate from cardiac arrest. We're really proud of that. We've worked really hard with UT Southwestern. We've partnered with them with a bunch of resuscitation studies. We've gone anything from how fast you do CPR to what medicines you give during CPR. Right now we're doing one about how you treat somebody's airway when they've had cardiac arrest. And what the work we've done with them is not only increase the save rates here in Mesquite, but across the nation. A lot of local departments, they also go in on this, and we're changing the way cardiac arrest victims are treated across the country. So it's something we were really proud of on how hard we've worked for, to increase that. So we've increased our rate more than double, but we've been able to increase rates all across the country with that. Another thing that helps us is we have this cardiac monitor. You may have saw one in the ambulance, and we have one here. I'll show you later. And it's really, I'm really short changing it by calling it a cardiac monitor because it does measure your heart rate, and we can read your heart rhythm with it. It'll take your blood pressure. It measures the amount of oxygen in your blood. It measures the amount of carbon dioxide you exhale. It can shock you if we feel you have a dangerous, a deadly heart rhythm. We can pace you and put a pacemaker on you and make your heart speed up if it's too slow. So it really does a whole lot of things. It's really kind of shortchanging it, calling it a cardiac monitor. It's, it can do a 12 lead EKG just like they can in the hospital. They have the same type of thing in the hospital, but it's mounted on the wall. Ours, we gave it a handle and some bags to carry some stuff. But it's really been a great tool for us, and the cardiac save rates are, the, are one of the big things that we're proud of. So when it comes to going to calls, the biggest question I am ever asked is why do I see an engine and an ambulance going somewhere with lights and sirens? You know, most people think oh, the fire engine goes to fires and the ambulance goes to sick people. So unless a sick person is actually on fire, why is they both going, you know? So it's mostly about manpower. Yes, we do send an ambulance on a structure fire. So it could be a structure fire they're going to because we want to have an ambulance on standby in case there's somebody who's in the house is hurt or in case one of our guys gets hurt. But they're also still firefighters. They get there, they're still part of the fire attack team. They're working on the fire ground as firefighters. And if we need to get on somebody on the ambulance and go to the hospital, we can. We have it right there. We also go on any major medical call. We would send an engine or a truck as well, like a, a heart attack or difficulty breathing or a stroke or somebody that's in cardiac arrest. We want the manpower there. We want to get paramedics on scene with all the equipment so that we can do the best thing for our patient. At the same time, it's fairly expensive to send a ladder truck down the road. It costs around a dollar a mile. So we don't just want to send that on every call because it looks great in the yard. Because it does. I mean, it's pretty. You can sell the thing. We love to show the thing off. It's nice. But we can't afford to run it on every call. So we instituted this priority dispatching system. And our dispatch center has used this for years. About 20 years, Chief, right? The dispatch has used it on answering calls on answering calls. So hopefully you've never had to call 911 and hopefully you never do. But if you call, they're going to ask you questions. And the first questions are going to be things like, is the person breathing? Are they conscious? And if the answer is no, then they're immediately going to send an ambulance and an engineer truck with that ambulance so that we can get people there as quickly as possible that can try to save somebody's life. But if the answers are no, they're fine, they fell down and hurt their leg, there'll be more questions. And so it's questions like, oh, is it a bruise in their leg? Did they break their leg and half of it's hanging off and they're bleeding really bad? You know, there's lots of questions that go along with that to determine the severity of the call and determine whether we need just an ambulance or we also need an engine to go with that ambulance. 
And in doing this, we started this in 2015. In doing this, we've taken 21% of the EMS calls off the heavy equipment. And so that saves a lot of fuel, a lot of wear and tear. But also what it does, to me, is the most important part, is it keeps an advanced life support piece of equipment near your house for then if you need it. So we have people available. So that's really EMS in a nutshell. Everybody is advanced life support, seven ambulances, seven engines, and two lighter trucks. And if you call 911, we're going to get there pretty quick with a paramedic and an equipment to help you out. So there's going to be a question period at the end. But I am really easy to find at Fire Admin at 1515. Always available. Call, come by, any questions, we're always ready for that. So with that, I will turn it over to my boss, Deputy Chief Bruce Coons. How are you guys doing? Is it interesting yet? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll try to keep it going. Uh, the training division, we don't do just one aspect. We do a lot of them, and here's some of the main ones. And uh, I'll just touch on them, and then we'll walk through them a little bit. We do the hiring, the entrance testing. Then there's the continuing ed education. Once you get hired, you're just not a firefighter, and, and that's it and you just, you know, worm your way through a 30-year career without learning anything else. Part of getting on the fire department and also staying uh, healthy and proficient in the fire department is called the physical ability test, and uh, we'll walk through that a little bit later. And then finally, I want to touch on physical fitness training, uh, something that Brian which you would miss is there's a lot that gets left out and uh, we all do a lot we all have a lot of forks or you know a lot of sticks or branches in the fire so to speak um, but these are the ones that I want to talk about tonight I want to talk about the hiring process People really want to work for the Mesquite Fire Department and it is not easy to get on we give a a written exam once a year, third week of February. About 300 people show up to take this test. Now, you could go to another city just north of here, and they are a similar size. They give a test once a year, and they have a, over a thousand people show up. And one, of the, and the main reason is that we require at least 60 hours of college just to walk in the door to take this test. And uh, there's some other uh, mitigating factors that keep the numbers low, but we've been hiring a lot lately. We're kind of aging as a fire service, so a lot of our best uh, older firefighters are starting to leave the service after several years, and uh, we've been averaging about nine people a year that we've been hiring, and that's a lot. But when there's 300 that take the test and you're ranked number 40, it's not enough. Um, you take the entrance exam, and then after that, you have to take a physical ability test. And, and like I said, I'll show you that a little bit later. It's a pass-fail. You either make the time or you don't. Uh, if you pass that, and usually the top 25 to 30 are the only ones that we will send through the physical test. After that... Our uh, arson investigators basically find out who you are from about the second grade. Um, I'm always telling my two sons, what you're doing now at 15 and 13, it's coming back, okay? If you want to be a firefighter, there's going to be somebody like me asking you about what you did when you were 15, so don't do it, please. They get through that, and then they're lucky enough to sit in an oral board interview which is anchored by Captain Staples and myself and another deputy chief and if they don't have a heart attack from that we might have to start having the cardiac monitor in there for the pressure because they pass that then they have to go to Chief Kirby and uh, have another uncomfortable interview hopefully they can make it through that process and get hired we're actually or oral boarding uh, five people in the next two weeks to try to hire three to start school next February. It takes about 18 months to get fully trained up to actually go into the fire service and uh, start producing. 
six months of fire school, six months in the station, another six months to be a paramedic. It's not easy. The continuing education, the state of Texas requires 20 hours of continuing education a year. As you can see below that, we require 10 times that amount. We love this city, we love the citizens, we want to be fully prepared to protect you and take care of you. An additional 12 hours for officers. We have multi-company drills. Um, they actually had a multi-company drill today. Then several of them set up their equipment for you guys tonight, and I wanted to talk about some specific things even on top of this because there's different avenues that we have to follow to be proactive. I like to think of firefighters as, as professional daydreamers. We're really good in the what if department. What if this happened? What if this happened here? What if this happened down the road? What would I do? This one's not so hard to figure out, is active shooter situations. In Vegas, the Dallas police officers, both of those gentlemen either lived or were living in Mesquite at the time. This is right around the corner. I'm not saying it happens, but nobody else was either. And so we have been, we've spent the summer training with our police department so that we can better respond to such a horrific incident should it happen. Uh, this is a picture of the actual first uh, training that we had. Um, it actually chokes me up to look at this picture sometimes because police and fire, we don't always think the same. Uh, we have different mindsets, different outlooks, but on this one, uh, we're on the same page. Uh, I brought some of that equipment. You can look at it later. There actually are uh, bulletproof vests and helmets for every position in the fire department now, so every person in operations has one right behind their seat uh, should they need it because in such a situation, you don't go to a locker and go pick it up. You have to have it with you at every, all times. We also do training that is specific to certain areas of the city. This is kind of hard to, to, to picture. That's an 18-wheeler tr tractor trailer, and it's got radioactive waste in it. Now, I-20 is a hazardous materials corridor, and uh, several times a week, hazardous materials do travel along that corridor. And so Station 7 that Chief Kirby showed you and Station 1 and also the chief that's over the operations for this day, they all had this training just last week <coughs> to reinforce how to recognize hazardous materials accidents, what to do, how to measure the radioactivity should it uh, escape, Although, if it will put your mind at rest in the 20 and 30 years that they've been sending this stuff down Mesquite, there's never been a radioactive release in any accident. The packaging is insane. You can see it right there. The physical ability test, I told you I'd get back to this. That was the loop that you saw at the beginning. That was actually Brian uh, going through it um, in... Uh, fine fashion actually. The physical ability test, as this says, it assesses the physical necessities for firefighting and I might add also patient handling because it takes a lot of lower body strength and technique to lift patients time after time and not get injured. Uh, I don't know if you can recognize the gentleman that is pulling the sled in this slide. He actually opened this up. He's our chief because he is a sworn member of this fire department and every member who is in this fire department does this test at least every two years. It's mandatory. He did this in April and did a fine job. The 10 stations that we go through, I'm gonna walk through them real quick. And I want you to remember that this is without a break. Okay, this is a continuous time. Our times usually average between five minutes and about eight. Anything above eight, and we're looking at you sideways. So you go up four, uh, four stories with a two and a half inch hose line, weighs about 45 pounds, come back down, you drop it off, you move over to an extension ladder, you lift it up against the wall, that's the ladder heel, it's right around the corner. And then right next to that 
there is another extension ladder bolted to the wall, 24 feet. You take that halyard rope, you raise it all the way to the top, you lower it back down, don't let it slide through your hands. You walk over to a 135-pound sled to simulate pulling a charged or full of water hose line, inch and three quarters of what we pull. You pull that 60 feet around the uh, barrel, hopefully you don't get caught, and then you go back uphill a little bit and finish with another 60 feet. From there, you step to the right, you get in a little red box, and there's a 200-foot section of hose that wraps left around a barrel, and it's called a hose reel. You have to pull in the first 50 foot of that section. Now you're tired. But now comes the fulcrum. This is the pivot uh, station of the physical ability test. It's a forcible entry tool. We have to use hammers and uh, axes sometimes, something called a halligan, to get into buildings or maybe to get into a roof to ventilate. This is called the Kaiser sled. Um, and what he is doing, that gentleman there, he is driving that black piece between his legs, the length of this sled. It takes 30 to 35 swings of an eight-pound hammer, and now you're hurting. You pick up a ladder, carry it about 50 feet down around a, co a cone, come back and re-rack it against the wall. Then we have something called a ceiling breach and pull. We have to check for fire in the attic. I had a, a chief once that always told me, always think from the top, because that's where the fire is going. Heat rises, so you start at the top and you want to make sure it's not in the attic. Well, we have to, Chief Kirby alluded to it earlier, we cause damage to put out fires. We have to break into the ceiling area to see in the ceiling, and that's called a pipe pole, what uh, Captain Preston has in his hands. So this mimics that pushing into the ceiling and pulling it back down. And on this uh, breach machine, you've got to push up three times, pull down five times for a total of four sets. And uh, now you're tired. This is an equipment carry. It's a 15 and 25 pound kettlebell. You carry them 75 foot out, around a cone 75 foot back. That's a K-12 saw and a chainsaw, I think. It's some of the equipment that we have on our, our engines and our trucks. Finally, victim rescue. It's at the end for a reason. We have to be able to take care of our citizens, take care of each other when we're tired. That's a 180 pound, 185 pound dummy you have to drag it 25 foot backwards by yourself around a barrel and then 25 foot back down. Like I said, what I just described to you, we've had people do it in under four minutes. Now, he's Superman and he leaps over tall buildings and he couldn't make it here because he's saving somebody else, I'm sure. But So you did it. You made it through, right? No problem. Yeah. Kind of a problem. This is very challenging for us. You can't just sit around and not work out and just nail this test. And this test isn't, it's not an end of itself. It's a measure of how we're doing and how we can take care of you and whether or not we can stay fit. So what do we do about it? There's a problem in the fire service. We have a tendency to retire with damaged shoulders with uh, backs that don't work anymore, with shot knees. We donate our bodies to this job. And although some of it, you know, we knew going in, this is a dangerous profession, it doesn't have to be that way. And so in Mesquite, we have started a new fitness initiative. We've always worked out. We've always had equipment to work out within the stations. But to this point, we've never targeted what we do as firefighters and what we do in handling patients. And so we've got a fitness initiative now to address those two physical demands of the Mesquite Fire Department, those fire ground activities, which are high intensity, short duration, anaerobic activities that you have to recover from. Heart rate's going through the roof but then you have to do it again. And then patient handling. It's weird because you bend over, you pick up a patient, and then you twist and you bend over. 
and over time, our backs are shot. So we're working on techniques. We're increasing mobility to be able to get down to the ground in good form. Stability, our core stability. Capacity, being able to lift heavier weight from the bottom and technique. We don't twist anymore. We actually point our foot and we rock to the sides. We work on technique to take our backs out of this. It saves us money by reducing injuries. And I'm, I mean, I'm happy for that. But I want us as a fire service to be able to do our jobs and then when we get off for those two days, to be able to take care of our families and to do the things that we want to do with less pain. The name of this fitness initiative is Ready for the Call, but the question is, are we ready for the call? And so we've instituted six levels of programs. The first and the simplest level is a stationary rowing machine. And you'd think, well, rowing machine, what does that do? Well, one thing it does is it's no impact. It's not low impact. It's a no impact exercise. And if you do a rower, and I'm telling you guys this, I was telling my mom this, if you get on a rowing machine at the Y or at your local gym and you row for three minutes kind of hard and one minute easy for 15 or 20 minutes total, it will really increase your health. And it won't hurt you. Uh, it's a great thing. It's a great start. If all we did was this, if all we did was stretch at the beginning of the shift, which we do now, that would lower injury. But what if we stretched at the beginning of the shift and then a lot of them are just doing rowers because maybe that's all that they want to do. Working out in the fire department is mandatory, but how you work out is not. But we're putting out programs so that they can follow functional fitness to the job that we do. So that lowest level is rowing. Then there's other programs that increase in complexity and length of time, but nothing takes more than 30 minutes in at the fire station because we can't wear ourselves out working out and then go on a fire call because that's our primary, you know, that's our primary mission. So we have to be able to stay in shape, but we still have to answer the call. And then the top level, we have certified peer fitness trainers who can actually design a program for a firefighter should they desire that. So there's all levels that they can go. We want to be ready for the call. That is such a big area. It has to do with uh, reduction of cancer, what kind of gear that we use, uh, sleep habits. Um, the fight or flight syndrome that we get when there are some people call it alarm stress it encompasses a lot this focuses on the fitness aspect and the technique on how to handle patients and those are the goals improve performance on duty and reduce injury saves the city money by reducing those injuries and 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 not having so much lost time but more importantly it uh, increases the well-being of our firefighters so that when they retire at 30 and 35 years, they're walking out upright instead of giving a speech holding onto their arm. This is a picture of some of the newest recruits we have. We hired them about a year ago. Uh, you know, I sometimes think the fire service might have passed me by. We didn't have any of this 25, 30 years ago. And uh, we've made mistakes along the way, fitness-wise, but these guys are just starting out. We're going to have a culture of staying in shape, being ready for the call, so that these guys can have a successful career physically, knowing that this is a difficult job, and uh, they can have that well-being throughout their career. That's all I have. And now I'm going to turn it over to Captain Travis Greenman. He's going to talk about fire prevention. Good evening. I'm Travis Greenman. I'm a captain. I'm in the prevention division, as Chief just said. Uh, my specific title, I'm the PIO, which is a public information officer, and I also do public education. So anytime anybody wants uh, any of our crews to come out to, the, uh, to their school, I'm the conduit through which everything comes. So I do all the scheduling. 
Uh, a lot of times I'll go out and do fire safety talks and things like that, which we'll cover here in just a second. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. In the fire prevention division, uh, it encompasses both public education and inspection. Uh, so we have a fire marshal, our deputy chief, uh, deputy chief pastor. Uh, we have a prevention captain uh, who is over the inspectors. We have the public information officer and pub ed uh, officer, which is myself. We have four inspectors, which are, uh, they're all lieutenants, and then three arson investigators, and they are dual certified, so they are both firefighters and police officers at the same time. So uh, these are the, the gentlemen that, um, when we were talking earlier about doing background checks, where they turn over everything from second grade, uh, these are the, the three guys that will do that, the three positions. Um, the different types of inspections we'll do, we'll do routine business inspections, which is our uh, annual inspections. Uh, certificate of occupancy, uh, sometimes you'll hear that called a CO, uh, hotel motel task force, foster care inspections, um, permit work if you have anything worked on uh, with a sprinkler system, uh, fire suppression systems of other sorts, uh, hood systems, things like that, that comes through us. Uh, reported problems, uh, if a citizen goes to a business and they see that like all the exits are blocked or something like that you can report that to us we will send out an inspector to go check that out and correct the problems uh, new construction and if you can see down at the bottom uh, we have approximately uh, uh, 55 or 5400 locations that need to be inspected uh, over a thousand alarm systems and uh, 637 sprinkler systems fire sprinkler systems uh, InterGov is a new program that we instituted. I believe it was May 15th is when we went online with it. Um, this is uh, in an effort to streamline our capabilities and ho hopefully help the uh, public get things turned around quicker. Um, it's uh, a program that we can all, all uh, the inspectors can see. They can look up by location. They can look up by permit number. Uh, they can see previous visits. So, for instance, if there was an inspector today, then he was supposed to go inspect your business, and he was sick, and he has a history with your business, we can have another inspector step in, take that. He can look up the previous inspections, and he can say, okay, well, these, these have been issues in the past, and so I know exactly what is happening, instead of having to wait for the other guy to come back, have a conversation with him, find out what's going on. So um, all this is done online. Uh, and so, the, again, in an effort to streamline things so that uh, it's a virtually instantaneous uh, turnaround on inputting information for us being able to see it. Um, we are almost totally paperless, not completely paperless at this point. I think there's two forms that we still do on paper, but we're uh, in the process of eliminating that as well. So, uh, so that has been uh, our most recent change, and it's a pretty big change, but it's a good change. And so hopefully uh, um, it'll speed things up quite a bit. Uh, the fire safety education. This is the lion's share of what I do. Uh, school visits, uh, fire, or October is fire safety month, so we do a lot of school visits during this time of year, although uh, we make visits any month that anybody wants us to come, but this is when uh, the requests are at the highest. Um, station tours, if there's a large group of kids, um, that also comes to me. We have on our website we have forms that you can fill out and request a date, and you can say how many people are coming and what it's for and things like that. Um, if you just have one or two of you, uh, feel free to go to a station. Just knock on the door and say, you know, no emergency. I just just want to come in and see your stuff, and they are happy to come show you everything. Um, uh, uh, every firefighter started out as a kid who really thought lights and sirens are cool and 90 percent of us never grew out of it that's why we're doing this still um uh the fire education is both for seniors and for children i do get calls to come do fire safety talks at some of our uh, retirement homes um a lot of times we just need to have things reinforced or uh i mean and when i tell people what the fire safety tips are like let's well, you know it's not brain surgery it, it's just kind of common sense things but um, a lot of times we need to be reminded of it so as soon as you hear it you're like oh yeah i I should have remembered that. So, uh, and those are two of our most at-risk uh, populations, both children and seniors. So, I, uh, I do quite a bit of that. Um, fire extinguisher classes. Uh, um, a lot of times, businesses will call me and ask me to uh, show their employees how to use fire extinguishers. There's a certain method that we use, and I kind of talk about how you can look at each one, tell what type of fuel it's supposed to be used for, how it actually puts out the fire. Um, Citizens Fire Academy. Uh, I believe the chief. 
Chief Kirby brought this up earlier. Um, this is a nine-week course. We're dead in the middle of it right now. Actually, we're in the back half of it. Uh, it does start in September. It usually culminates uh, about a week before Thanksgiving, sometime in that time frame. Uh, each of those weeks is kind of a different uh, topic. Uh, we cover everything from the, the first night is fire history and an introduction to the fire service. And then um, each week successively teaches you about a different aspect of our job. So we have one night that's engine operations, one night that's truck operations, uh, which is what we're going to do this Thursday. So the, the students are going to get to cut up cars with hydraulic tools and climb the aerial ladder that you saw outside. Uh, not, not straight up. It's going to be at a respectable angle, but, they, uh, but you still get to climb it. It's high enough. Um, and it's a really fun time, and it, it's just a good... Uh, a good way, a lot of people just uh, don't understand how the fire service works. I, everybody sees the fire engines and sees the firemen, you know, uh, out at the grocery store or just out about town or doing their jobs, but a lot of the ins and outs of it, people just never really think about. And so this, this is a really good way uh, for us to be able to tell you how we do our job and why we do the things we do. Um, we have a smoke detector program and uh, juvenile fire setter programs. Um, and all, both of those are, uh, in fact, this entire, <laughs> this entire slide is all things that are, uh, that are components of my job. Uh, so also, uh, part of my job as being public information officer is, uh, should anything happen uh, large enough that the uh, news agencies want to know about it, that they come to me. Um, uh, I have a phone that's dedicated to that, and um, we've get. You know, we still get newspaper calls as well. So anytime anybody needs to know anything, uh, you typically the chief and I have a pretty good uh, line of communication. And so I'll find out the pertinent information and, uh, and I'll speak with the news agencies and kind of pass on what is happening, why we're doing, again, why we're doing what we do. And uh, that's it. Let's give it up for the staff. They didn't make You'd be glad to know you're only one minute all over, Bruce. You did a good job. <laughs> well, we're going to take some questions. We have all of our staff here from all the major divisions in the fire department. I'm here. And uh, just let you ask questions for about five or ten minutes. Yes, sir. Well, it's kind of a phrase. Uh, I've had a couple encounters. Um, I had a fire in my house. There wasn't a blaze coming out, but there was smoke, and, and uh, two fire trucks came out. And I was so surprised that they didn't bust everything up. You know, things collapsed, and all that. Uh, it was really in good order. It was the kitchen. And uh, then get up into the attic, top down. And uh, so I was just real, real happy that the way that they took um, care of that without just expecting there would be I want to thank you. Uh, the, we've always just told the public is that's what we do is, is service. That's what we do. We're serve, we're there to serve you. We're there for. Uh, we talk a lot about about priority dispatch and all these different systems and stuff. But when it gets real down to it, it's a human element. It's someone here to help help you. And that goes for fire department as, as well as our brethren in the police department as well. That's that's what we're here to do is to serve you and to, and to help you in, in the time of need. Uh, like that window, there's a traffic accident. Mm -hmm. The fire department and the ambulance showed up, but how come the police department have to show up? How come the police department have to show up? Uh -huh. Believe it or not, they're going to have to find fault with somebody because the insurance got to pay for those cars. <laughs> but really, they're, they're there uh, to... Sometimes people are injured, and they, they do have to take reports when there's property damage, and there are some laws in the state of Texas they do have to enforce. Um, 
we're there to assist anyone that is injured and to also make the car safe so they can be towed away. It, it takes a team. It's a coordinated effort on the highway. It's one of the most dangerous places that we work is on the highways. Think about the traffic going by a lane, two lanes over. Even if they slow down, they're going 40 to 50 miles an hour by us, whizzing past us. And we're there to try to make those cars safe, get the tow dr driver in there, and the police are involved with all the legalities that, that have to be that have to be taken care of as well, and try to get that car and uh, and those people out of the highway so we can open it up. It's a it's a big deal in the Dallas Fort Worth area to get that traffic flowing. It costs a lot of money. Those traffic jams that you see, you just look way back. It is costing a lot of money to keep those cars idling there and those people there that need to be places. It's lost productivity. It's uh, wasted fuel. It's, it's, it, there's more traffic accidents on down the line. So it costs a lot of money. So we're there to try to orchestrate getting, getting the people taken care of, number one, getting the cars out of the road and getting the traffic opened up. And it does take that many people to do it. Yeah, it seems like uh, so every time we were heading west on Interstate 30, there's, there's the sorts of uh, six flags. Mm -hmm. There's always a traffic accident on 30. <laughs> yeah, it's, we just live in a, com a community or in, in an area, metropolitan area. There's a lot of cars. Um, I go out running in the morning, and I, I go over that town center bridge, and I just stop and sometimes just look down 635 of all the cars and it's amazing I'm just looking at such a small section of the Metroplex and so many cars and it's going on all over miles and miles yes oh, I'm sorry yes. okay I'm gonna let uh, it's a Kevin program Rubin. designed uh, <clears throat> we do have uh, it's a program we do have some smoke detectors in our city uh, that are available for the public. Um, it is, uh, you have to be the homeowner for one. And then ideally it's designed for people that are uh, elderly or disabled or, uh, you know, if the cost of buying a, um, a detector would be a financial burden, we'll come out and I'll um, replace or put in up to three of them in your home. And I'll kind of talk about why, why I put them where I do and that kind of thing. So that's it's there's a link on our website it's what was that? I'm sorry I can oh word of mouth yeah. Yeah. Good question. Has there been? Okay. We do get calls by about it. We do take calls. We, we get we get calls about it weekly on smoke detectors, but. If you're a realtor and you want to get the word out, help get the word out, you can tell them to go to our website and, and hit the link and they communicate directly with us to, to get that word out. So you can be help, helpful in that, that area. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was how many hours did y'all have? Did y'all have a amount of hours to build a speed prior to per person? So how do you compare to other cities in the area? We have the highest, uh, we have the highest college requirements in the metroplex I understand that. but what do you how do we compare yeah the oh um you know i've never even looked i just that uh rescue task force with the police and the fire there is a group of two fire stations that are doing it right now with the police department at nine o'clock at eight o'clock at night from eight to ten tonight to me it's more of a necessity this is what we need to do to be ready i've never really looked at the other fire departments to see yeah, kind of obsessive right 
four times the amount of hours? You know, other cities, we have a neighboring city that they focus more on the fire side than the EMS side, and we didn't talk a lot about it, but um, for all the fire training that we do, I think we focus more on the EMS side. More on, um, you talked about obsessive, we fill out what they're called patient care reports, and uh, we have a quality check of patient care reports where uh, an, an EMS officer will go over that patient care report to make sure that it's accurate and that it's complete. And if a fire department checks about 25%, so one out of four of those, that's considered uh, excellent, that they're really paying attention, we check them all. They check 100%. They check every single run for quality and accuracy. Uh, you know, it's, it's a hard job to get on. It's dirty and tiring, and we get sleep deprived, but it is a very highly trained profession that, because it's, it's not only to help you, but if we're missing something, if we make a, da a bad decision, he might not go home tomorrow if I make a bad decision. Or you might not go home because we made a bad decision on the highway. So as far as other fire departments, if they're training more or less, you know, I don't, I don't know. Thank you. Right. Well, there is something called the insurance services or ISO. It's called it's a rating. It's kind of an insurance rating, and. Uh, they rank cities with the things that you were saying between 1 and 10, 10 being basically the highest rating that you can attain. And I'm not sure the numbers now, but there were two fire departments in the Metroplex that had an ISO 1 rating, and we're one of them. <laughs> yeah, you can thank Chief Kirby for that because he's, he's a stalwart in keeping that going. There's actually been there's been several others in the last few years that that, yeah, that was a long time ago. But to answer your question, the 20 hours, that's a pathetic minimum. So we basically do train a lot more, but it's it's necessary with all the technology that we have and the different uh, situations we find ourselves. It's just necessary to be out there and training that much. And believe it or not, we're not training all the time. They get some they get some slack time too. Yes, sir. Um, yes, I have a question about fire safety. Mm -hmm. um, this past Fourth of July, I asked about flyers. Every single house in our neighborhood is saying uh, fireworks are illegal. We want you to off. And of course, we still had dozens of people in my neighborhood shooting them off all night long. So my suggestion would be for for future Fourth of July events, what if we were, if the city were to designate one specific site that maybe has a bar or camp or a gallery? Say, if you insist on setting on fireworks, go to this designated site that's monitored by police and fire, but just don't do it in your neighborhoods or in your driveways or not. Would that be a, a good compromise? That way it's safer and people can still have their fun. Well, I don't know if it'd be safer for the individuals that would be setting them <coughs> off. It might be safer to get them out of the neighborhoods, and we have discussed that. Um, there's been different approaches by different cities um, all over, not just all over the state. It is against our fire code to shoot fireworks off in the city limits of Mesquite. It's, it's actually against a lot of possess them as well. I think uh, this last Fourth of July we had a, a bigger push than we had had in the past, and it's not going to stop just just one event. Uh, it's going to take multiple multiple events, multiple years to get out there, and unfortunately, it's going to take multiple ticketing of people 
to get the word out. They're going to have to show up in our municipal court and pay a fine for having those fireworks. Uh, luckily, we didn't have any uh, major fires this year. We basically uh, had a pretty, a pretty uh, abundant year for rainfall. But there have been years where in the rainfall we're in droughts, and it was very, very dangerous to have those fireworks. It's also a mixed message uh, to the citizens of Mesquite uh, when they have fireworks out on the outside of their city limit in the county area. Uh, when you come in, there's nothing we can do about the sale of fireworks. That's perfectly legal. It's within the state law for them to sell those fireworks. But it does give a mixed, mixed message to the public that, hey, they're selling them right here. I live right there. But what you did, thank you very much yeah. for going out and putting that out. We appreciate that. Uh, if we have more, more uh, volunteers in our neighborhoods doing that, I think we get the word out. But it, it does it does take a while to, to keep that from to get that down. It it, did get, it has gotten a little bit out of control, and we're not the only other city. Another city, others. We're not the only city to see that. Other cities in this area, as well as well in Central Texas, have seen commercials. Uh, a lot of things going out over the web, trying to reel it back in. We're not we're not using it uh, as much. But I have to state this too, our state legislatures are making it a lot more easier to obtain fireworks and to sell fireworks in the state of Texas. There's more times that, more times in the year that they are being sold. So I would urge you to contact your state representative and tell them you don't like that. You don't, you don't appreciate that. And um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Ted, I think you probably want to get up here and say something. Ted Chen? I'm going to turn it over to one of our. Uh, it's it's time we. It's eight o'clock. We're going to have to close this up. But I want to turn it over to one of our uh, managing directors, Mr. Ted Chin. He works in our uh, city manager's office. And uh, thank you. Thanks. Give it up one more time for fire department. <clears throat> yeah, it's my responsibility to make sure these uh, folks have the resources that they need to do their job day in and day out. By any chance, uh, do you all know how much of the City's operating budget goes to the fire department. Percent? Take a guess. Anybody? Say again. Twenty-six. That's pretty close. Twenty-four percent. Almost a quarter of the entire city budget goes to the fire department. That's how much we care and how much the council um, has it as their priority to keep you safe uh, day in day out. So, with that, I'll introduce Mayor Stan Pickett and he has some closing remarks for you. Not really fair for me to answer those questions, I guess. <laughs> yeah, these guys are going, he ought to know that. He ought to know that. Well, we thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, I would be remiss without, and they may have been introduced earlier since I slipped in a few minutes late, but our Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, Dan Aleman, and uh, our your former firefighter here and, and our new council member, Sandy Burrow, here as well. Uh, we appreciate them being here tonight. Anything particularly you guys want to add? Or? If I may, Mayor. Uh, sure. I'm just so grateful for these men and for the work that they do. I just had a few comments. One is that their profession that they do is truly like some of these professions that are out there, that it's a call. They never stop being firefighters, even when they take off their uniform. I believe that. They continue to be a firefighter. It's a special profession. But not only that, uh, just appreciate so much. You know, as a city councilman from the outside looking in, one of the things that really impressed me this past year is being able to go as an elected official to some of the retiring receptions that they have. And there's such a strong brotherhood there. And it's huge. And I appreciate that so much. It's, it's not something you can teach. It's something that is just captured among them that they're there for each other. And I appreciate that with the, for them so much of what they do. And, uh, and then also, just this past year, seeing how two large fires were fought at the same time over on Galloway and then down in close to Creek Crossing and, and just showed how our men are prepared they're prepared even for two large fires that can be going on two different extremes of the city and they're out there quickly and then also just to mention harvey our our men were ready to receive folks that were coming up from the coast and coming up to this area they were there ready to serve so i just want to applaud them and thank them so much y'all did a great job in your presentation thank you so much thank you chief kirby appreciate you all so much sure I just want to, these guys, 
I retired from the fire department here in Mesquite, be three years in December. But I did 30 years, and almost every one of these guys that are here tonight, I consider my family and my brothers. There's not one of these guys that wouldn't do anything for me that they wouldn't do for you. They love their job. Um, I can remember, you know, 33 years ago when I hired on the department, we had fire trucks that didn't have a top on them. You were riding down the road, and if it was raining, if it was hailing, it didn't matter. You, you were getting wet, but we still went on a call because that's the kind of equipment we had. But over the years, and at that time, we rode on the back of the engines. We didn't even have a safety strap to hold you on. You just held on, drove down the road, you got dressed so that you were ready when you got there. But over the years, the fire department has changed. The safety has changed so tremendously amount. And we can thank our city leaders through the time that I you know, was on the department that they saw that this needed to be done. And the equipment that we have now is so much better than what we had back when we hired on. And I can guarantee you our, our council is still looking and will give our fire department, our police department, the best equipment that's out there. If we know it's gonna be safer for our firefighters, if we know that it's going to help our citizens, we're gonna be able to save you, do a better job. Believe me, this council is gonna do it. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all our guys that came out tonight. Great presentation, and thank you to all the citizens that came out too. I really know better than saying any of you politicians want to say a few words, but anyway, thank, thank you, Guy. You know, I just got to say that. And we appreciate all of you being here tonight. I think you see the commitment that not only the city has, but the commitment that these men and women uh, who serve uh, us every day as citizens, it's just tremendous. And I'm not going to keep you. I appreciate you being here. I always say, since you do have the mayor in the room, does anybody have any questions that they want to bring on me? Because I'm happy to answer. <laughs> if not, Ted, we're done? We're done. Thank you all for being here. We're done. Have a good evening. <laughs>